Like me. The best sellers. Webster is next on BCTV. Good morning. It's getting so in Canada that you can't tell the political players without a program. In the good old days, pre levesque we had four major political parties. What do we have now? We've got schisms, we've got groups, we've got federations, we've got concepts, we've got Uncle Tom Cobley and all. Now yesterday you met Elmer Knutsen, the founder of WestFed. This morning, they had a big bash last night we're going to tell you about. This morning, the strongest spokesman, Carl Nickel, former Tory MP, millionaire oil man from Calgary, is going to be on the program. Also on the program is going to be Hugh Harris, a defeated liberal who started a new thing called the National. He doesn't like the use of the word party, it's the National, and it's to do with the West. And then for light relief later on, we've got an invader from Whitehorse by the name of Rolf Hogan. But first, it's going to be you, Carl. And I expect you this morning to spell out, which Knutson did not do yesterday, the concrete reasons why not just oil men, but the man in the street should join and sympathize with your aims and objectives which might split the country. Can you do I'll, that? I'll try that, yes. Promise. I'll do my best. First, the report on last night's meeting by Steve Wyatt III after the break. <laughs> Like. Are you coming up on me first? Yep. 15 seconds. 15, I'll 15 seconds. How many people last night did you save? I'd say about 1,500. You'd say between 12 and 1,500, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, 12 and 1,500, I'd say. That's yeah. fair. Yeah. Let's set up for 2,000. Yeah. What's your opening line so I don't repeat it? Oh, it's me, Jack. <laughs> um. It must be said that West Fed's first big meeting in British Columbia was not a flop. A lot of people, a lot of money. A lot of memberships in the delightful surroundings of the Hyatt Regency. Steve Wyatt was there, for sure. Jack Westfed wasn't able to quite fill those 2,000 seats, but it was close enough to make this their biggest rally so far in British Columbia. But what these people heard was not so much about Western independence, but the by now familiar laments from Calgary boardrooms. And for that, they brought along their favorite general, Calgary oil man, Carl Nickel. The cabinet approved and the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Energy presented to Parliament in October the combination of budget and energy package which constitute with Constitution 1980 by far the most destructive and most discriminatory legislation ever introduced in Canada by any government. It would be at that point, ladies and gentlemen, that I had to make the final decision as an individual, as many of you will have to make a decision, and that was that we are now left with three choices in Canada. Lie down and take it. I'm not prepared to. I don't think you are. Further negotiate 
We've tried negotiating route for the past year without success with the gang you want to have in Ottawa. The third choice, fight back. So we now come to the point of fighting back. Will it be successful? I don't know. Will there be enough Western Canadians who feel that if we can't have the kind of Canada within its present boundaries that we were brought up, of, brought up in, fought for, and learned to love? Will we have a Western Canadian nation which is fully economically viable and which will impress, I hope, upon other parts of Canada that a Western Federation, if a majority of its people so decide, will be economically more viable and far stronger than what is left of the eastern parts of this nation. The theme was familiar. The East always has and probably always will steal from the West. And underlining that, WestFed launched a new campaign in BC. The organization needs money. Four million dollars worth, a quarter of which will go towards a million dollar advertising campaign. Along with donations, the crowd of over a thousand strong offered several standing ovation to the Western Federalists, who insist they do not want separation. And in turn, the Alberta strongmen offered a heavy dose of Trudeau bashing, with West Fed President Elmer Knudsen predicting a liberal dictatorship. And if you want to sit on your bum, then you are going to find a unitary state, a one-party government, and a dictatorship. So I say stand up and be counted, and pay us the money. And they lined up to give their money. For $5, the already converted got a West Fed membership card. Wait, will, uh, you, will you join WestFed? Are you a member? I'm going to join right now. I'm just looking for my wife to have her come over and join with me. Was it the meeting that finally sold you? I wanted to know what it was about, and I found out. And I believe that when people hear the truth, they'll, they'll be lining up to sign up. Were you convinced by what you heard in there tonight? Yes, I sure was. Yeah, I was really impressed. Very Were impressed. you a member of WestFed before you came? Yes, I've been interested in it for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Are you a Western separatist? No, I'm not. No, I'm a Canadian. That's what I am. I'd like to see a Canada where we can all live and make a living and keep what we have. And, and you think WestFed can help, help yes, you out I with that? Yes, I definitely do. Yes, I do. I think the West needs a real strong voice, and I think this is our only chance. What did you think of that meeting in there? I thought it was a disgrace against Canada and against the flag. And I think it's a disgrace against the Canadian people, an affront against the Western Canadians in that they can't negotiate with the East and they, all they have to do is separate. Mr. Nichols said something about how he wants to unify Canada, but the organization of which he's a member states that, uh, that the provinces of British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba form a Western Canadian Federation and he wants to have a federal constitution for, you, for you those provinces. You obviously aren't convinced when they tell you that they are not a separatist organization. They are a separatist organization. They deal with semantics. They don't deal with the truth. And you know, the whole thing eventually turned into what it, it deserved to be, which was a, a circus in there. Yeah. I'm fed up. <laughs> I suppose that's as good a reason as any, isn't it? Was it this meeting that convinced you finally? Oh, no, I've, been, I've been convinced that something had to be done for a long time. Would you like to see the West separate? No. I'm a Canadian. I was born here and I, I'm a Canadian, but uh, something has to be done. I don't, don't see any uh, other alternative. But, you want to uh, see some more clout in the West? I, th I think it's about time. Can you tell me what, what you thought of that meeting tonight? Oh, they've got Excellent. Their... Excellent. But I don't think they go far enough. I think we... I think they're going to have to separate before and, and remake Confederation from West to East. You think the only way it's going to work if the West separates entirely? Yes. And maybe then remake Confederation. Especially... Right from scratch. Uh, right from scratch. As long as Trudeau's in there. Yeah. <laughs> tell me honestly now, are they really selling as well as you had expected? <laughs> Uh, full, full, and full all the way down the line. Give me an estimate on how many new members you got no tonight. I have no idea. But it's bound to be in the hundreds. Than the bound to be. On. Oh, easily. It's got to be more. Yeah. More, than, more than 200, say. Oh, I definitely say so. We almost had that before we went into the meeting. I was busy selling, signing them up, and they're still signing them. Do you think that meeting was enough to convince over a thousand people in there that the West should have more clout? It's a start. It certainly is a start. I think the younger people that I've been talking to are starting to realize that we have to support the adults and know what's going on. 
And here is Carl Nickel in the studio. Now, Carl is routinely described by the media as a multimillionaire oil man from Calgary. Do you think that puts a kind of wrong complexion in your organization? Because all the NDPers in British Columbia, of which they're legion, you know, say, ah, they're just a bunch of Calgary oil millionaires whose ore has been, whose ox has been gored by Trudeau's nationalization policies. There's the fact that you are the heavyweight spokesman in influence, not kind of disenchant the working man. I don't think so. Actually, I can't tell any of the media how they describe me or anyone else. Mm -hmm. I happen to be fairly wealthy, but I've also gone through the period of starting at 20 cents a day in the dirty 30s and building something, as I hope that all Canadians will have a continuing right to do in a nation where every Canadian is equal, and they are not equal in the Canada of today. Now, you were a Tory MP back in the 50s. In the 50s, yes, sir. Under Diefenbaker. No, before Diefenbaker became the Prime Minister. Now, here you are now, and I tried with Knutson yesterday, and I didn't quite get it clear. I want to try it with you quite simply. The simple aims of Westfed, you know, look like a duck, walk like a duck, quite like a duck, I think you're a duck. Now, are you a separatist or are you not, or can you give me a finite definition of Westfed's aims as of this moment through your eyes? Yes, I would say this, that West Fed is a federation of like-minded people, regardless of what sphere of activities they may be involved in, who believe that Western Canada is now made up of second and perhaps third class citizens, subject to discriminatory actions by a federal government, which appears to desire a centralized socialist republic. And that is not the kind of Canada I want. In other words, the socialism of Trudeau, which you're saying, is what really frightens you half to death for the future of Western Canada. My fear is this, that while the industry of which I happen to be a part is the target today, who comes next if the, the trio of unilateral constitutional package opposed by most provinces becomes law, mm -hmm. if the budget and energy package as now proposed in Ottawa becomes law, mm -hmm. and we destroy the basis of energy security for all Canadians, and then who comes next? Will it be the BC fishing industry, the BC forest industry, the mining industries of Ontario and British Columbia? Just one last... I don't want to see that happen. Do you start out with a totally separatist aim? We start out with the proposition that anybody in Western Canada or anywhere in Canada who believes they were heading down a wrong path may be free to express their views and to develop what may eventually become a, a so-called separatist movement. Mm -hmm. In other words, it might be summed up this way, separation if necessary, but not necessarily separation. More with Carl Nickel, and later The National with Hugh Harris after the break. Before I get down to nuts and bolts with Carl Nickel, let me put a kind of philosophical proposition to you. Lesage, the quiet revolution. Levesque, the separation. All the not kowtowing, all the pleading with Quebec from the West, as well as Central Canada, to stay in the country. Now, have you deliberately adopted the same kind of attention-getting device? In other words, the only way that, the, that uh, Trudeau will, if he ever does, listen to you, is if you scream about separation. That, I believe, is the only route we now have left. Efforts to reach a compromise, which has been the traditional system in Canada for the last 113 years, has failed in 1980. Mind you, 100, 113 years, as you say, uh, the Charter of Rights, we're now going to get one, and I'll agree with you on this, stuffed down our throats. But that wasn't the final straw that broke your back and made you join Westfed. What was? The combination of what I would call the unholy trinity of unilateral constitutional 1980 plus a budget and energy package which destroyed the future of the whole nation. Was it not the fact that Trudeau said that uh, any talk of separatism in the West was hysterical? That was the final straw which convinced me I had to join West Fed. Now, I, want, I don't want to do Trudeau bash all morning, but 
Is it only his socialist, what you regard as his nationalization of socialist attitudes? Is it Trudeau you're after or is it the Liberal Party? I'm really not after any individual or any political party. I happen to believe as a Canadian that every Canadian should be created equal. Every Canadian should have the right to build on an equal basis. What and has I don't happened, like being well, kowtowing to any part of the country now, as we have in the West for so many years. As we always say in the, in the kindergarten, sharing is caring, right? That's right? Did the East not, to some extent, help develop and share with the West for many years before the burgeoning of all the wealth in Alberta and British Columbia? To a far smaller degree than Eastern Canadians now assume. I would say this very bluntly, that uh, because the subject has been raised in Ontario by many recently, that on province of Ontario as consumers in that province are now receiving every single month as much benefit at the expense of Western Canada on energy resources as all the so-called benefits that Ontario provided during the first national oil policy during the 1960s. And Ontario was among the areas in the East which helped erode that policy and forced Western Canada to sell oil and gas in larger volumes to the United States. Now, when you say, you mean in dollars and cents, you mean because of Trudeau's policies, we, are, we Alberta anyway, is now subsidizing the protected economy of Ontario. Is very that heavily, right? In very what, heavily. Give me the figures on that. I'd like to know something about that. Well, very briefly, I would say that the package that was offered by Premier Lougheed of Alberta on behalf of the West to Prime Minister Trudeau last July was a package more beneficial to all Canadians as consumers than what emerged in October from Ottawa. To the extent of a nine billion dollar a year passing on to all Canadians as consumers at the expense of the Western Canadian oil and gas producing provinces. You mean cheaper prices? Cheaper prices, far below world level. But not as cheap as what Trudeau is trying to do at the moment. No, actually, Alberta and its adjoining province have never asked for world prices, despite what you may hear in eastern Canada today. No, I'm quite clear in my mind that when Clark and Lougheed almost made a deal, That's it right. was to bring the prices over a four-year period, was it? That's right. To something like 85% of the Chicago price. Up to 75% of the Chicago or world price. Well, who blew that? Clark or Lougheed? That was blown by the rejection of the Clark government in a vote early last year. If Clark hadn't been so naive and go for that budget vote and without making a deal with the Socrats, would West Fed not have appeared? Had a deal been made by any Canadian government, regardless of its party, that recognized the legitimate rights of Western Canadian provinces, there would be no need for separatism or such groups as West Fed or any other in Western Canada. There is a big difference here, is there not, between the Levesque uh, Parti Québécois struggle and your struggle, the West struggle, in that we're not involved in cultural identity, we're involved in money. We're involved now in straight economic issues. In other words, uh, I would put it this way, that we cannot put food on the table by wrapping ourselves in a flag, whether it be the maple leaf flag or some other. But wouldn't we, with this great newfound wealth in the West and all its potentials, really be denying the underprivileged in the East a chance to share in the billions of dollars of development ahead? What I am saying is that we are already prepared to provide and are providing benefits to all Canadians as consumers to the degree of over nine billion dollars a year. How much more must we provide to satisfy the East or satisfy the regime in Ottawa. One of your handicaps, of course, is, on a long-range basis, is that you've got an NDP government in Manitoba. Am I right? No, 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 no. Saskatchewan. NDP government in Saskatchewan. Blakeney. We might well have an NDP government in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. Many NDPers, as you well know, endorse the national or the Canadianization of the oil industry. And they're very happy to see Trudeau cut their share of the take in uh, to have control of our resources. Is that not a very strong argument for people to stay away from your West Fed? No, it is not. Uh, for example, we'll see we have an NDP Premier of Saskatchewan, Mr. Blakeney. Mm -hmm. I would say that Mr. Blakeney, because of recent events, will 
not allow himself or his province to be bribed by the federal government. Now, just a minute. You're not suggesting that in any way, shape, or form that Blakeney or Lougheed would join Westfed? I don't know who will join Westfed. That's an individual decision for all Western Canadians to make themselves. Well, what is it that uh, I know? I know of something of the political split between Blakeney and Broadbent, but That's what right. has uh, Lalonde or Trudeau done recently to upset Blakeney? Well, on January 1st, the federal government tacked on an extra $6 a barrel in federal export tax, which has caused the loss for Saskatchewan of a 25,000 barrel a day market in the United States. That's on which, heavy oil. On heavy oil, which has caused a cash loss, according to the Saskatchewan finance minister, of half a million dollars a day to the government of Saskatchewan. I don't think that with that kind of loss imposed by a greedy government in Ottawa, that Mr. Blakeney will continue to give any kind of support to the kind of package that has been dreamed up in Ottawa. Well, but didn't Broadbent, Blakeney, and Trudeau make a deal on the indirect taxation of the, of the potash resource? And didn't that please Blakeney at the time? It may be pleased him at the time, but I think Mr. Blakeney now takes the position, what would happen if Ottawa is successful in this drive in oil and gas? Would Saskatchewan potash be the next target for federal control? Now, another point that Mr. Blakeney and all other Westerners must consider, are we prepared to continue paying as we have for many years? World prices plus tariff support plus transportation to buy the manufactured products needed under a system to develop Central Canada. Should Central Canada continue indefinitely or permanently to be the bellwether and the controlling factor in the nation of Canada? More with Carol Nichols. Take telephone calls too. You're going to meet Hugh Harris, who's another complicating factor in this political turmoil. It is political, isn't it? Very much so. After the break. <laughs> Three short questions to Carl Nickel. Do you think that Lougheed will carry out his cutback policies in March to reduce the oil to other parts of Canada and force the federal treasury to buy it in the world market? Uh, Mr. Lougheed's proposal was one, I think, the only answer he had left, having tried and failed to negotiate a settlement of the issues. But he has pointed out in making his announcement, there'll be no cutback of Alberta production or there'll be an end of any cutbacks if any Canadian goes short because of world conditions. Will Trudeau, and if it comes to a really nasty dust up, use the good order section of the BNA Act to impose federal will on Alberta? He might try it if but he wants a revolution. If he used the good order thing to impose his oil policy, that would bring real conflict. I think he would have the same results as what Trudeau tried to do in 1970 in the province of Quebec. You mean the War Measures Act? Correct. But there are not civil liberties involved on the face of it here. It's economic liberty, isn't it? That's right. But as you recall, the federal government has decided that it's quite willing to pay world prices for Mexican, Venezuelan, and Saudi Arabian oil mm -hmm. at a price which costs the Canadian taxpayer now more than twice the price that the same government in Ottawa says is enough for Western Canadians to produce. The standard uh, liberal cry, though, is that if they came up too sharply to world prices, it would cause mass unemployment in industry. I agree. And, of course, that is partly why, and the main reason why, the Alberta government, Saskatchewan and British Columbia, are quite prepared to see all Canadians move gradually not to world price, but to 75% of world price. I thought but right now it's 45% of world price. Are you price. crying the blues on behalf of Alberta, at least this morning, about the jobs and development lost to BC because of Trudeau? I'll put, it, to Alberta because of Trudeau. I'll put it very bluntly that I see a loss of jobs across Canada because of the cutbacks in energy capital this year, a loss of jobs of a minimum of 100,000 Canadian jobs, of which over half will be in central Canada, and the rest will be in western Canada. And this, to me, is a disaster at a time when Canada, in total, contains energy resources of many kinds, which make Canada potentially the richest nation on Earth. 
This is because of what? Why are we going to lose $100,000 jobs quite simply? Is it because the American companies won't develop? Is it because Lougheed is going to hold back on the tar sands and this crude oil and this heavy oil development? Is that it? Because the American rigs are fleeing the country? Or Canadian rigs are fleeing the country? Canadian rigs are fleeing the country, yes, because drilling contractors owe a great deal of money. They can't leave rigs idle. And by the end of March, at least 200 of the rigs that were active at the end of 1980 in Western Canada will have lost their contracts and either must go broke or move elsewhere to greener pastures. Is it easy to bring them back again? No, it isn't. Are you tempted to take your company and invest in the States? My company is one of the many Canadian companies which must be responsive to the rights and the needs of its investors, who happen to include several Canadian pension funds in my case. What does that mean, though? It means you go to, if Netflix. We are spending 40% of our budget in the United States and have during 1980 and 81. This is new? That's new. So you're going to just take your money out of the country and put it where it makes no, most? No, we are continuing exploring in British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, we have been exploring in the Arctic Islands for 20 years, mm -hmm. and we have in the past year shared an exploration offshore between Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia. But you wouldn't see this. I would dearly love to spend all of our capital in Canada if we could find conditions in Canada which would attract capital to the job. And it's the energy policy in the budget which makes you and people like you say, no, not attractive enough, killing the industry. Well. You say not attractive enough. Actually, every investor, whether it's Mrs. Jones with $100 or a multinational company or a Canadian company with millions, must look at the bottom line. Would you or anyone else in their right mind, if the bank rate or bond rate is 12%, invest their money at 6%? No, you wouldn't. You'd go broke. You would not knowingly put anything into any kind of investment, knowing in advance you would lose money. Doesn't Trudeau know what's happening to your people in the West? I don't of think he the does. $100,000 jobs? I don't think he or does. Or doesn't he care? He doesn't seem to care or know. Mm -hmm. Call to Colonel Nickel. Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack, I can't help but think that uh, some of these fellows are looking like very greedy, grasping individuals. Uh, perhaps they do have the country at heart, uh, particularly Western Canada, but they seem to have forgotten, or at least looked like they've forgotten, what negotiation's all about. Uh, I hope, in fact, maybe what they're doing now is, in fact, uh, an attempt to bring the federal government to the negotiating table. But uh, would you would you concede that you really are a pressure play for Lougheed? No, I would not. We are not a pressure play for any individual or any particular political party. Nor are we greedy. We accept the proposition that all Canadians should have energy at the lowest possible cost. But as a so-called expert on world energy, I am not prepared knowingly to see all Canadians go down the drain economically to face many, many years of increasing energy shortage and higher cost because of stupidity at the political level in the center part of the country. But the scenario is therefore that the Trudeau policies you say discourage development, discourage jobs, discourage the possibility of being self-sufficient. And if he wins, he will then nationalize the lot. Uh, I don't care whether or not he tries to nationalize so much as I care about the future energy supply for all people in Canada. And there must be encouragement to look. I would put it this way that uh, there must be encouragement to look. And I would put it this way, too, that let those who sound off, whether it be a labor union, a political party, or the federal taxpayer, or the federal member of parliament who sets the rules, mm -hmm. let them put their money where their mouth is under the same conditions they expect the private sector to invest their capital. I didn't see any labor leaders at your meeting last night. I don't know who was there. No, but, you know, I would have recognized a couple of them. Go ahead, please. Hello, I am a member of a youth group. Mm -hmm. And um, I was at your meeting yesterday, last night, yeah. and I had some of your literature in front of here. And you um, said before the break that you are a non-political association. You were, you are a political association. And yet, on your membership form, you say a non-political association. How can you uh, say that you are one thing, and yet uh, you uh, do another? Very simply, the concept of West Fed is to, if a majority of Western Canadians or areas within any part of the present Canada decide in the majority that they want something better or different than we now have, then we would move to the next stage of setting up a Western Canadian Federation with a constitution 
established by the people, not by some central authority in Ottawa. And uh, that would then bring a non-political federation or group of people finally into the political arena. We are not a political party at this time. You would concede, however, that your adherents are largely right of the political spectrum. Uh, no, quite frankly, however, you mentioned NDPers out west. I, I don't like the present socialist leader in British Columbia. I don't like the present liberal leader in Ottawa. Ottawa. I don't like the present Tory leader of Ontario. I think all three are playing for short-term political gain and to hell with Canada and its people do and their future. Do you foresee any trouble between Blakeney and Broadband? I do, yes. I think Mr. Blakeney of Saskatchewan, an NDP Premier, is one of the most intelligent men in political life in Canada. I would cannot see Mr. Blakeney accepting the kind of blackmail accepted by his federal political leader and by the federal government in an effort to make the province of Saskatchewan not go along with Alberta and British Columbia. Go ahead from Creston, B.C. Hello, I was wondering what the Western Federation policy is on immigration. The um, federal government is going to be bringing in 16,000 refugees and around 100,000 skilled workers, presumably for the oil rigs. Okay, just uh, stop there right now. Do you have a policy in West Fed on immigration? The policy of West Fed will be established by the people themselves when they decide on a constitution. The answer if is no, do. you, you don't we have do a policy. We do not have a policy, but personally, I would support immigration of people needed in Canada. As a man who does not believe in discrimination of any kind, I believe that we must do our part in helping solve the world refugee problem. But basically, you want to see skilled immigrants come in when we need them. Yes, but not for oil rigs. We're not going to need them in oil rigs simply because the rigs are not going to be working in Canada. At the moment. At the moment. Go ahead, please, ma'am. Yes, I would like to know if Mr. Nickel has ever lived in any part of Canada besides the West. Yes, I have. I have spent a great deal of time in every part of Canada through the years. I hadn't been born in Winnipeg, brought up in Calgary, but to a greater degree than most Canadians, I've had the privilege and the opportunity of visiting everywhere from the American border into the North Pole area of the Arctic and from British Columbia to Newfoundland across Canada. When will West Fed make its first approaches to anybody on a small p political basis? I mean, the point is, here you are, you're creating this, seems to be a big storm coming up one way or another, and you say separation if necessary, but not necessarily separation. How are you going to tackle that problem? You're going well, to go and see Trudeau, you're going to appear in front of the Constitution Committee and say, oi! I have seen Mr. Trudeau some years ago. As a matter of fact, I spent three days with Mr. Trudeau in his cabinet back in 1969 to warn him specifically and set out in fact and figure what was going to happen in energy in the 1970s. They didn't believe us until four years later the OPEC crisis finally hit as we told Mr. Trudeau it would. Don't forget, we didn't believe the oil companies either who told us that there was enough oil for the next thousand years and then when Joe Green and Wham were out of oil. No, actually, it was the case of many Canadians, including Mr. Green, confusing potential with proved reserves. Now, we have a tremendous potential, yes, enough for a great many centuries, but proved reserves are a different matter. Potential will not heat a home. Mm. We have been involved, for example, we discovered the first gas field in the Arctic Islands 11 years ago. It won't be worth a damn in deliverable energy for at least another five years. There has been over 10,000 shut-in gas wells in Alberta. There are today. We know now there is a big potential off Newfoundland and Labrador, but that's potential. It won't become deliverable energy for five to ten years. Fair enough, I forgot the point. Do you know Hugh Harris? Yes, I do. I'm going to bring him in next and see if you guys have sisters under the skin, and then I'll carry on with him in some detail later. Fine. Uh, Carl Nickel. Next, Carl Nickel and Hugh Harris of something called The National. It's not a news or anything, it's just The National. After the break. Now, I'm not trying to confuse the issue, honest to goodness. 
But Dr. Hugh Harris is the, is the founder of a group called The National out of Edmonton. Now, Dr. Harris was a liberal MP. Did you quit Disenchanted with Trudeau or what? Yes, sir. Yes, you can't stand the man. Well, I, I think he's, he's made a mess of Canada and he's had a wonderful opportunity to do better. Now, in 25 words or less, tell me what the National is or is going to be. The National is a pro-Canada party with a, uh, its roots in the West. And what we want to do is to assert a Western voice, a strong Western voice, into federal politics. Canada has two regional parties now. The Liberals from Quebec, the Tories from Ontario. We, we don't see a solution to our problems without strong representation at the federal level. Well, you've forgotten the third party, which is very strong in the West, the NDP. Yeah, the, I think the NDP is, is philosophically distinguishable, not geographically like the other two. Okay, so you're going to have a political party, no argument about it. Yes, sir, that's what we're forming. With the liberal philosophy. No, we think that uh, there's some of the things that the liberals have done of, uh, in, a, in a philosophic sense are quite wrong. We don't agree, for example, with the kind of government structure they see. We think that, uh, and, and we, we violently disagree with the, what, what they've done to the Canadian dollar. You have a non-socialist philosophy. Correct, sir. Right now. And do you want, what do you want to do? You want to elect XMPs under the national label. Yes, sir. And then negotiate with Ottawa in a normal manner to change or uh, to bring in a new system of constitution or whatever. Yes, sir. We think that the Senate should be altered and so on, but we don't think that either of the existing parties are going to give Western Canada the power that it has properly coming to it. Why do you think of Carl Nickel and Westfed? I think Westfed, uh, separate, uh, I, I believe them when they say they're separatists. I think separatism is, uh, is a symptom and not a cure. And uh, they say they're non-political. We see the, that politics is essential to change the system. We don't think that you can take a, 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 a so 100,000 names to Lougheed and say, now, Mr. Lougheed, we'd like you to form a Republic of Western Canada. Because uh, Lougheed's going to say, well, what about the other 1.9 million, million people that we have? So we believe that, that you've got to get into the political arena. So That's therefore, all. Carl, it's quite clear that your aims and aspirations are totally different from theirs. No, actually, our objectives are much the same. The methods are different. Yeah. That's right. You're going to go political. That's right. You're going to elect MPs if you can. Yes, sir. Right. And campaign against all of the existing parties. That's correct. But based, of course, on because you were an, econ an economic advisor to the World Bank and you're uh, an economist of some considerable note, you believe the energy policy is... Oh, yeah. The en energy policy is is crippling Canada. I, there's one, you know, Carl is, is far more knowledgeable than I about, the, about energy, but I can just tell you this, that the failure to commence those two heavy oil plants in northern Alberta will react most unfavorably on Ontario and Quebec because that's where that's where billions of those dollars are spent and that seems to be not uh, comprehensible to Mr. Lalonde and to Mr. Trudeau. You mean to develop the heavy oil plants, Carl, uh, in Alberta, all the machinery or the rigs or whatever would be built in Ontario? Yes, that's true, actually, of almost every phase of energy. Well, why are they so short-sighted? Because I don't think that Mr. Trudeau and those whom he directs in Ottawa have any real realization of economics, as Dr. Harry's and a lot of others uh, have. There's a man waiting in the line whom I think wants to either have at you or agree with you. I'm not quite sure which, but I want to use him. Go ahead, please. Hello, is this me? That's you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Webster. I'm a businessman visiting from Montreal. I was the president of the No Committee in my area during our real referendum. And it makes me just a little sick to see a Boy Scout who's tired of playing golf and who I understand lives in Arizona most of the time now getting into something here to, to take his boredom uh, in front of the people uh, and having another person here who's suggesting another political party uh, which would uh, maybe equate us to Italy, where the government have to change every two or three months. Baloney. Hold on a second. Baloney. Hold on a second. I, li I, I like your snide remarks. Do you live most of the time in Arizona? I've never been in my life in Arizona. Do you live most of the time in Arizona? I don't live in Arizona at all. I live in Edmonton. Who uh, lives in Arizona? I don't live in Arizona. 
All right, I must have been... Sorry about that. I take it back. I must have been reading about someone else. In any case, the, the, the problem with Canada today in my eyes, and I travel it consistently, is the thought that we have local interest in every area. Uh, the Maritimers are interested in the Maritimes. Quebecers are interested in Quebec, Ontario and Ontario, the West and the West. And uh, if, if our friend, our, our, our millionaire oil man here, uh, being a good econ uh, economist, uh, talking about uh, the profitability of different ventures, why wouldn't he build these oil rigs here in the West uh, rather than let this go down to Ontario? Well, well, sir, let me put it this way, that the manufacturing capacity of Canada at the present time happens to be concentrated in Ontario and Quebec. Why is and that? And quite logically, that should be the source of supply, as it is today. Why is but, that? We haven't addressed the fact at all. That no, no, it's that way because Ontario and Quebec... In Quebec and Ontario. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. You're going to go off the line. What is the reaction among your no-committee friends in Montreal to the appearance of groups like... Uh, West Fed, Western Concept, or even the National. What is the reaction of you English-speaking Montrealists to this kind of thing? Well, I think we're sick of it. I think we're absolutely sick of it. We have a wonderful country here. I travel around the world quite a bit, and we just don't know what we have. And by God, we've lived under the British crown for so many years. Uh, they defended us, they protected us, they provided guidance. Now we're slipping under the American, or we are under the American uh, umbrella. You, you certainly don't sound like a member of the Parti Québécois. I beg pardon? You certainly don't sound like a member of the Parti Québécois. Well, no, I'm not, sir. I'm a, I'm a liberal, and it's vive That's le Québec right. libéral in Quebec these days. Well, sorry you're disappointed, and thanks for your call. We'll finish a couple of calls, let you go, and then I'll carry on with you. Right. Go ahead, please. Oh, thank you, Jack. I'd like to speak to Carl. Right. Go ahead. Uh, Carl, this is an old friend, Mike Wood. I served with you in the militia. Also, How are you, Mike? Uh, with your brother Sam, with the Calgary Highlanders. I live in Langley. I support you 100%, and we'll do all we can to help you. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much, Mike. Thank you very much. Where do I go now, Glad? Uh, hold on, please. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, could you please tell me? Uh, I'd like to speak to Mr. Nickel. Right. Speak up. Go ahead, please. Where are you? I'm here well, in... Well, do um, speak, ma'am. I'm sorry. I was watching the TV in uh, your all different times. No, no. Well, I want to ask your TV Mr. And... Nickel how you c joined his federation. Oh, we don't need... To, you've got, they're in the phone book. Phone bill, Clancy's. The other thing is that I agree with everything that he has said up to now. Thank you. Thank, I get very short-tempered with favorable calls. It doesn't uh, add to the content of the program. I don't care whether they're favorable or unfavorable. We had to expect that, all of us do, in going into anything that is not university. Carl, I'll finish with you on your prediction. You know, I must admit, I look at your, your group with some acerbity. You right. do seem to be right-wingers. You do seem to be preoccupied almost entirely with money, which ain't a bad thing, with jobs. I don't feel you're broadly based. Am I wrong? And what's going to happen to you? I would say this, that the great majority of the members of West Fed are not in the oil and gas business. They are people drawn from the farming community, the ranching community, the professional groups in the Prairie Provinces and B.C. They are people who quite sincerely believe that if we lie down and take it now, we are doomed to continue taking it from Ottawa and central Canada through the next several generations. If Trudeau, I'm not prepared to if go Trudeau that way. disappeared, would your organization disappear? If the successor for Trudeau were to recognize that all Canadians should be equal and would deal with all Canadians on that basis, I would say that there would be rejection by Western Canadians and others of the concept of splitting the nation apart. What's going to happen to your organization or your views if Trudeau unilaterally patriates the Constitution with his Charter of Rights amended in little bits here and there? Well, as I pointed out last night and again earlier today, I believe that Mr. Trudeau is aiming for a centralized socialist republic in view of the reported threat he has made to the British government, change the BNA Act, patriate it to Canada, in the light of what Mr. Trudeau in, intends to impose through Parliament, mm -hmm. without regard to the rights or interest of all the provincial the provinces of Canada, except that of Ontario, which seems to endorse his views. My thanks to Carl Nickel. Next, Hugh Harris of The National, after the break. <laughs>
Good. Dr. Hughes. Dr. Harries, as I mentioned, Hugh Harries, as I mentioned earlier, is an economist of note, was a consultant to the World Bank, obviously knows where he speaks in that particular area. But your party, is it your own brainchild? Well, no, there are a group of us that have discussed this for the last five years. It's my idea to go ahead now. Why would you call it the National? Why wouldn't you call it the Western Party? Well, because it doesn't need to be just Western. Uh, we, we think that the Northern Ontario and the Maritimes have very much the same kinds of problems with central government that we have. But it's very much just a tiny little organization at the moment. I mean, you've... Oh, at, at, at the moment, we are, we are not a party. We are simply uh, establishing to organize. We, the next four months, we want to try and, and build uh, a group of people from the various constituencies in, uh, in Canada to go to a founding convention. It, it's purely a sort of a technical job at this time. I mean, uh, Elmer and uh, Carl Nickel have got a minimum of 20,000 members oh, of claim. Yes. Sure. You know, sure. they're between 12 and 1,500 sure. out last night. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, they're, 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 an or they're a functioning organization. We just feel that they've, got, they've diagnosed the problems but their solution is, is just a, a sort of a non sequitur. And you're a pig in a poke. Oh, yeah. As far as philosophy is concerned, you're oh, a pig in a poke. Well, we've got a couple of four, uh, three, four things that we've lined out sort of basic, but your description of it as essentially uh, undecided at the moment is right. Simply because, Jack, I don't, we don't want, we want live in a democracy. I don't want to be a dictator and say, this is what we're going to do. Okay, you, when, uh, when did you last serve in a, a Trudeau government? 72, when 72. I got defeated. But you ran again, though, did you not? I ran again in 80, yes. And got wiped out. Oh, yes. <laughs> really wiped out. And there are no two liberals west of the lakehead, yeah, of course. Yeah. But, but you, you don't subscribe to the fact that we're not represented in Ottawa, do you? Merely because our MPs are Tory and NDP. No, we, we, we're not represented in the government. And the real problem with the Tories is that in order to form the government, they have got to cater to Ontario. So they really become powerless as, a, as an effective regional voice. That's, that's the difficulty. All right, give me the shot on the economy. How does the economy look to you in Canada today, and how will it progress? Because he will pass this energy package. There's oh, no right. doubt about it, You're is right. there? No, 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 not in my mind. I mean, he'll pass it, yeah, come right. hell or high water. Yeah. All right, what's going to happen to us in the West because of it? Well, there's, the numbers that Carl was giving are substantially correct. We have just finished a study uh, on the impact of delay of the two major projects. As a matter of fact, I was meeting with the people yesterday. And there's no question that the cash flow consequences of this budget flow right through to development drilling, to exploration. And uh, we're going to hit a very, very serious slump. The ordinary listener, and myself included, often gets confused about delayed development. And you're yeah. talking about Lougheed's previous plans, had he made an agreement, to develop the tar sands and the heavy oil deposits. That's Is that correct. correct? Yes. Imperial Oil have an $11 billion project at Coal Lake, which is now on hold. And All Sands have a $9 billion project at Fort McMurray, which is similarly on hold. Now, those two projects alone can, in my view, spell the difference between a Canadian economy that has got jobs and growth and one that's just flat. Didn't Lalonde rush up with money to Imperial Oil to keep the thing oh, live? Sure, sure. How much did he promise them? 40, 40 million, which will take care of their technical staff for a period of about six months. Now, was Lougheed involved in that one at all, the no. Imperial Oil one? No, no, he backed away from it. His is the $9 billion one of swear. Well, the, the, nine, the nine billion is at Fort McMurray and the 11 is at Coal Lake. Now, what about the tar sands? Well, that's it. The, I'm sorry, the, the Fort McMurray nine billion is tar sands. That sand. is the tar sands. Yes, sir. And that is on hold right now. No yes. further development. No. And um, I, uh, let me get this right for the sake of simplicity. Because Lougheed says, I will not put money into this or develop it as long as you won't pay me the right price. Yeah, well, bas basically, Lougheed is saying, this is a this is a, a project that we can control because they have to they're responsible for infrastructure and so on. So it's his bargaining tool. He says if we go ahead with this, why then we don't have any power left to bargain with the Fed. So he's just sitting tough on this one. Even though it will damage his own economy. Well, that's of course it'll damage the Canadian economy. 
damage his, his too, though. Well, the? well, no. This his he may be able to take care of the Alberta economy because he's got six billion dollars worth of petrochemical projects that are in process, and he can speed them up. That's really the problem. Uh, that it's Canada that's going to suffer. Not all about it. No, no, and that's wrong. And then, of course, he's got his heritage fund by which. I mean, you're so prosperous in Alberta. Did he not pay off all the debts of the municipalities some little oh, while back? Well, that's, that's right. As a matter of fact, he, uh, some of the municipalities have got cash in the bank and they're living on the interest. I mean, they're, the municipalities in some cases have been turned into real capitalists. By Lloyd. Oh, sure. They, they, there was a grant, I forget what it was, five million, or I know, five he, I know he paid off all the municipal oh, sure, debts. Sure. Okay, yeah. for, with you, on your telephone section, you, what I want to find out is if there's anyone interested in joining a new right of, is it right of center? I hope not. Middle hope Road not. political right. party, which will not be NDP. That's one That's thing right. you can say. That's right. And pro-Canada. We think, we think the separatists have analyzed the problem, but they don't have a solution. We think the solution is through political action. Have you got a leader in the wings? No. Because there certainly can't, we've got no leaders in them. Around the country. Well, <laughs> I'll drop the rest of that remark for the moment. Hugh Harris, economist, the national, a new political party, federalist, not separatist. Not separatist. Clean out the Tories, clean out what's left of the Liberals, have a new block with some NDPs, of course, to face Ottawa. Yeah. If, if I may, the progressives in 1920 are, the spir are, are sort of our spiritual godfathers before I was born. After the break. It can be said without any exaggeration that Hugh Harris is obviously a glutton for punishment, you know. Right? Well, I, have a I mean, a, a new political party without any... I mean, it's not as if you've got something really glamorous to go with. No, no, that's right. You just that's say, here, we're middle-of-the-road people, we're very nice, decent people. We want to finish all the expensive liberal and Tory organization and put new types of liberals and Tories yeah. in Ottawa. But we're pro-Canada, and I think that... And we're a Western voice, and we've got to have a voice, Jack, where the things that have been happening... You know, I sat in a Liberal caucus. We've got Senator Ray Perot and Senator Ray... Well, great, Bud, yeah. Olson. Bud Olson. And Hayes Nagu. Sure, sure. That's, that's like... And having, Axworthy. Sure. What you're telling me is you've got a saddle and no horse, that's all. <laughs> and it's hard to get anywhere, because you not only have to walk, you have to carry the saddle, you see. That's the difference. Oh, boy. Go ahead to Hugh Harris. Good morning, Mr. Harris. Morning, sir. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a Canadian who was born in Ontario, educated there, raised and uh, moved west, uh, westerner by choice. And uh, I've followed uh, your career politically uh, uh, in the House and uh, in Alberta and so on. Uh, I, uh, I am a Canadian, and uh, your approach to this political problem uh, certainly appeals to me. I uh, would also like to see a, a provincial wing of your party. Uh, I'll be very brief. Mr. Nickel and yourself have uh, mentioned oil consistently throughout the program. Uh, we here in BC are sitting on billions of dollars worth of coal that doesn't seem to be able to move. And uh, I'd just like to hear uh, your opinion on, on, on the coal problem. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Well, again, we think that, that this country, with its resources, not just oil and not just coal, but, but its total natural resource package, should have the soundest dollar in the world and should have the happiest group of people. And we think that the only way you can have that is by getting rid of the restrictions and letting development take place at a world uh, market level. And uh, coal or oil, they're all the same thing because we've got it here and that's what's so, I, I find, frustrating that, that we, we continually seem to be able to, to turn every opportunity into a problem. As I said to Niccolo, the, there is a fair amount of sympathy for the fact that Trudeau is moving in on the multinationals to some extent, yeah. right or wrong. I mean, surely a country should eventually own its own resources. Oh, yeah. Well, again, I, I think one of our one of our very 
strong convictions is that the resources should be owned by the provincial government. Sec and secondly, I have no argument with PetroCan. I've, I've done work in half a dozen countries uh, where you're dealing with only the national oil company. And let's face it, uh, I think the, the multinationals have made some terrible mistakes and I don't find them as being uh, subject of my They're of not my the concern. saviors of the country. Oh, no, no, no. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to speak to Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris? Yes. I've, it's been a pleasure listening to you, and I hope you continue, and certainly I'll be one of your followers. Oh, many thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to ask Dr. Harris to comment on an observation you made, Mr. Webster, in your conversation with Mr. Nichols. In a preamble to a question you suggest, I think I quote you, then he will nationalize the industry, referring to uh, Mr. Trudeau and his socialistic tendencies. That's right. Uh, Mr. Trudeau has said in the past, and I, this is what I'd like Dr. Harris to comment on, that there's no need to nationalize given the power of taxation. And I think the incident in Saskatchewan now where the power of taxation has effectively ended the export of oil is a... Uh, in keeping with tr the validity of Trudeau's observations. He doesn't have to nationalize industries. He can control them through taxation. Well, that's right. You, you don't need to own something if you can take all the net revenue. It saves you the problem of management. And heaven knows that the federal government have demonstrated their incapacity in that regard. Are you aware, Dr. Harris, of the circumstances under which Trudeau uh, made that remark? No, I'm not, sir. No. But I know that in the energy budget, uh, it says that Petrocan and other crown corporations may well be may be authorized to buy and take over multinationals. That's right. Well, Isn't that I, right? Oh yeah, I think the, the federal government are well aware of the problem of getting Bill Hopper so powerful that he starts to dictate to them. You know, he's a very energetic yeah. fellow. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I just want to uh, say something. Uh, that I have a little more knowledge of the inside work in Ottawa than many others. And, now, please uh, demonstrate it to me. Hello. All these people are coming out as uh, separatists or whatever. I just want to tell them that uh, they are just adding more problems to the present problem, uh, creating uh, more uncertainty in the country. Uh, uh, and this could lead to... Uh, more businesses running away from here, uh, including the people themselves. They are talking now, a lot of them. Thank you very much, sir. Matter of fact, I was going to put to you that it's funny that you, an economist, should be involved in political conflict, which might in some tiny little way affect the value of the dollar. Well, <laughs> yes, and hopefully if we, get, if we can make some progress, it'll, in, it'll make the dollar uh, better, stronger. What's going to happen to the dollar? At the moment, it's going to it's going to languish. Just languish. Stick yeah. around eighty three cents. That's what I think, and because uh, it's got to be supported at that level. Go ahead, please. Yes, Mr. Harris. I must say that listening to you is like a breath of fresh air. After listening to the silly old Carl Nickel, and I must admit, Elmer Knutson sounded even sillier yesterday. <laughs> they hark back to the days that I can remember in nineteen seventy three when I lived in Calgary, worked for an oil company, and the bosses that I had to work for walked around with with um, posters on their briefcases and on their bumper stickers that said, let the eastern bastards freeze in the dark. It's nice to know that there are people, even at this late stage, who are willing to negotiate and moderate and be a, a rational, reasonable voice. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll let you go on that reasonable, praiseworthy call, because you don't want to let the eastern bastards freeze in the dark. No, sir. I think we want to stay with them and build a country, and I think what we need is a little more Western leadership to do that properly. You haven't mentioned the Constitution, patriation. Does that worry you? No, I think that we should bring the Constitution home, certainly, and then we should change it in accordance with the wishes that we can negotiate. Not in Canada? Well, certainly. Why ask the British Parliament to, to change it? Uh, they're doing a terrible job of their own stuff. Why do we want to meddle with ours? My thanks mm -hmm. to Hugh Harris of The National. Um, a foundling at the moment, which may one day be a political party in the West or across the country. Let's hope it's not an orphan, Eddie. Anyway. Yeah. Next, Rolf Hogan from Whitehorse, after the break. <laughs> My 
My next guest, Rolf Hogan, is a lucky man today. He's lucky because he's in Vancouver and not in his home base of Whitehorse to enjoy our balmy climate. Rolf Hogan, just to fill you in, is a man of parts, many parts. A businessman, he's a TV station owner, radio station owner, department store owner, and a satellite freak. Now, why should you be a satellite freak in Whitehorse? You right. should be happy with the lovely satellite you've got now, which brings BC TV, including Webster, into the homes of White Horse on the cable. Okay? Jack, it's just great to have you in the Yukon, and all the way up to Tuktoyaktuk and Inuvik. That's good. nice to know. I'm always big in the frozen wastes. And, uh, but I'd like to see you in Newfoundland and Labrador and Quebec and Ontario, and uh, the proposition of the satellite will do just that. Proposition of which satellite? Fill me in on technical details, I'm a disaster. I know at the moment that we go some ways to British Columbia, and then we go another way to Annick B, and we come down with a footprint in your territory and further north. Okay. What satellite are you talking about? You go up now on an experimental basis. Right. And your footprint, the region which you can reach, is really BC, the Yukon, a bit of spillover into Alberta. Mm -hmm. The proposal I have through an organization called CanCon is to uplink several TV stations from various points across Canada to a satellite that, when distributed, has a footprint or an area that the signal can be received all of Canada, from Newfoundland to Vancouver Island to the high Arctic islands, even if you wish down as far as Texas. CANCOM. CANCOM, Canadian Satellite Communications. So you'd uplift a station, say, from Montreal? A Montreal French language station. Okay, Hamilton? Hamilton, Ontario, CHCH. Mm -hmm. CITV, an independent from Edmonton. Right. And this very station, BCTV, and that is why I say you will be seen in Newfoundland if we're successful in getting the license. Now, once it goes up, it's got to come down again. And does it come down to these little us stations or does it come down into cable systems? Both. Um, it will be head ends of many cable systems, small cable systems, as our service is designed for the non-metropolitan areas of Canada. The, the remote areas, mm -hmm. and the remote areas are, if we turn them remote, are mainly southern Canada, not northern Canada. Mm -hmm. So they could be received by um, the head end of cable systems, they could be received and rebroadcast in a community on a repeater so that they could be rebroadcast to scattered communities and isolated areas. It'd be a bit of a shock for somebody li living in an output in Newfoundland uh, to see Webster coming on in the morning and do a bunch of... Uh, say a couple of local stories or a BC story, but they, I would like it. Look at would it. they like it? This thing I see is more than a business proposition. This is part of the issue you're talking about of unity of Canada. If BC can be seen in Eastern Canada and Ontario can be seen in Western Canada and the regional programming, that will de do more than the national efforts of the CTV network and the national efforts of CBC to bring the message from East and West. So I see this as a very important issue within the current constitutional talks and unity talks. I couldn't agree with you more on that because Canada and the, uh, the television we've had since 1952 has been composed almost, almost entirely of a centralist output from Ottawa and Toronto. It feeds and out. And it's all from... gone out from what I call the Eastern Media Mafia to the other ends of the country and very little goes back in again. Of course. Would that give people in the East the free choice therefore? Would we ever have the free choice to watch the local programming, say, of CFD or Toronto? No, CHCH Hamilton is the proposed station to be uplinked by uh, our group. But, I mean, it could well come to the stage where you could get any station in the country providing it's on a satellite. Oh, yes. And supplied to you by your cable company. Yes. Unless yes. you invested in a, an illegal earth station. Well, uh, I think the regulations within the country will require licensing once there's a Canadian alternative to the American signals that are now being received in many areas. When I was down in Hawaii, I spent uh, the odd time watching, I think it's WTBS, the superstation in Atlanta. Atlanta, yes. Uh, it got pretty drab at times, but it was on 24 hours and played the sinking of the Bismarck and the Graf Spey and all the old black and white movies. But it was a good concept because you got, from my point of view, you got continuous newscasts all the time round. But generally speaking for the Canadian audience, mm -hmm. to receive Atlanta or San Francisco, New York or Chicago, that are all on the satellite, Atlanta being the largest, is great if that is all you can get. 
But you don't get Canadian sports. You don't get Canadian current affairs. You don't get Canadian news. And the people who live in the, in the remote or underserved areas now find this very desirable initially. And, and they one, want something more. Yeah. When they first got the F discs up, and they got home box office? Home box it? office is one of those uh, received. But they still want to see the Canadian stuff. Of course they do. Webster and Rolf Hogan from White House after the break. And uh, the World Cup that's coming. That's World Cup, you know. The, the most important cross-country ski you event know, in I, all of the world. I met the playboy photographer up there who finally took the pictures of Dorothy Stratton who was killed. Remember yeah. the little guy, Yui? Yui? The one thing Rolf Hogan is not is you're not not as such an elected politician or anything. I'm right? not a politician, no. When is Yukon going to join Canada? We're looking forward to the day. Uh, you had guests on before who were talking about Western Canada and perhaps separatism if necessary, and you had a guest on yesterday. Uh, likewise, I suppose I should say the Yukon is looking forward to the day that it can join Confederation. As a province? As a province. We're a colony, uh, the last of the colonies, you might say. Uh, don't, you have an elected, don't you have an elected assembly of some kind? There's always news stories about trouble in your elected assembly. Of course we have an elected uh, assembly, but the, the, whole, the power rests in Ottawa, in the, in the Minister of Northern Affairs, and we, we can't sort of take the attitude that we're running our own affairs. Certainly we do the housekeeping, but the policies are established, the resource development policies are established out of Ottawa. We don't have that say. How many people live in the Yukon? 25, How many of those are uh, Aboriginal people? Uh, the uh, about 25 percent uh, uh, of the total population. Do they get a fair crack of the whip? I don't think they do now. I think under the uh, the present land claims negotiations, when this is settled, that they will. And uh, I'm very supportive of this uh, initiative because these people have lived there for centuries. When they make a dollar, they're going to stay in the Yukon. I can't see them uh, you don't see retiring any south type of thing. Now, you don't see any problems of paying billions and billions and billions, which will affect your economy for on the land settlements. I don't see a problem. I think that uh, they have a, a right to a settlement. What the settlement will be, I don't know. But when they have a settlement, they will be able to contribute substantially to the development of the North. How many MPs from the Yukon? One. Who is it at the moment? Don't Eric Nielsen. Eric, still Eric? Yes. He's been yes. there almost a thousand years, hasn't he? No, take away 980. 980, <laughs> about 20 years. Now, I've only been once in the Yukon. I flew up the side of a mountain in a helicopter and nearly died of fright. <laughs> I don't know who arranged that flight up the side of the mountain. But you were talking about the World Cup. What are, is that skiing or tennis? Cross-country skiing. The World Cup is being held in Whitehorse in, uh, around the 20th of March. And the North American Championships. Apparently, uh, and I don't uh, know that much about cross-country skiing, but uh, the, the course there is rated one of the best in the world. It's lighted with darkness as we have it there. It must be lighted. And uh, the championship, uh, the World Cup, will be held there. I mean, I, Forty countries of the world will be competing. How many miles do you cross-country ski? Is it a long, long course? I don't really know the details. But anyway, probably 15 When is it coming, this, this like World Cup? It's the, uh, around the 20th of March. First time? First time, yes. There, there have been junior Canadian championships and North American championships, but first time World Cup. I always remember watching you doing the old John, not you, but some very energetic people doing the old John London bit. John, am I, am I right? Jack uh, London, yes. the Jack London yes, bit. Yes, what yes. was that contest called where they packed 600 pounds of flour on oh, their the back? flour packing contest during the Yukon Sourdough Rendezvous. He's Which, incidentally, uh, we're hopeful that you will come to the Yukon. It's the last week of February, and do your broadcast from there. And I've been talking as recently as yesterday to Telsat Canada in hopes of getting an uplink so that you can be broadcasting live from Whitehorse to your audience. Uh, just a moment now. <laughs> What's the temperature at the end of February in Whitehorse? Last time I was up there, it was 33 below Fahrenheit. Well, look at Last week, it was two degrees above zero, our snow was melting, and Toronto and Montreal was minus 30, and you were flooded out with rain. The temperature in the Yukon generally is pretty nice. At that time, it'll be, uh, it'll be moderate. Now, okay, we'll consider that. 
but we could, if you get the Telsat, we could operate from there and send it back down here in the same way as we presently send it from here up there. That's right. Eh? This is yet to be confirmed, but... Uh... If I'm a young man looking for a job, which I'm not, are things so good in the Yukon that I can pack my wife and kids in a camper, drive up to White House, get myself a job at 15 bucks an hour, a house for a rent of 400 a month? There are jobs available in the mining industry and in the tourism industry. I wouldn't say the Yukon is undergoing any major expansion right at the moment. There are opportunities for those who want to work, mm -hmm. and the pay is good, uh, particularly in the mining communities, and the rent is not 400 a month. It's much less than that. Is that so? Oh, yes. No, there are, uh, there are great opportunities there are for young people. There are housing, but you wouldn't advise anybody to go without, first of all, nailing down a house and a job, I should presume, especially in winter time, unless you've got $10,000 in your pocket. No, I wouldn't want to suggest everyone rush up, but I mm. think if they looked around and, and carefully planned, there are many opportunities. Your yeah. basic advice is, though, is still go north, young man. Go north. Yes, by all means. By all means. There, there's opportunities in the Northland today that are not available to persons in the South. Just politically and briefly, uh, you say Yukon joining Canada. Do you mean as a province of the country? Should the Yukon be a province on its own feet, just like British Columbia? When you go through the frustrations of living under the present uh, colonial type status, the great frustrations of having uh, anything happen within the Yukon, I would say if the people of the Yukon want it, and depending on the financial agreement that might be developed between, Canada, uh, between the Yukon and central Canada, uh, I think the people would vote for provincehood, and I do believe that we can operate the Yukon more economically and less costly to Canada's home than presently. Does it get so cold that the liquor, that the whiskey freezes in the bottles in the liquor stores? The liquor stores are heated. If you take it outside, the whiskey will harden. The whole, the uh, the overproof rum will stay perfectly, no. totally liquid. My thanks to Rolf Hogan from White House. I'll be back after the break. I do believe we have a big interior story on Monday. Yes, we're going to look at the dismissal, resignation, or whatever of Frank Pauls from the Vernon campus of Okanagan College. Okanagan College. That's Okanagan College. Monday morning, ladies and gentlemen. And the time will be 9 a.m. precisely.
Hey Rolf, you're going to the airport. Yeah. 9 a.m. daily and weeknights following news hour final. Nine AM daily and weeknights following news are final.